Good afternoon. Once again, we will restart the regional conference on IPCC, climate change knowledge and solutions path towards COP26. So we're transmitting through the CORLAC site and you can leave all your comments on the chat there to be able to send your questions to the panel members and interact with them that way. Also on that same site, corlac.org, you will have simultaneous interpretation. Global warming affects and increases desertification, the degradation of land and food insecurity. It's these conditions that change the earth that affect the regional and other climates creating risks for human risk for human health and ecosystems. So the way that these risks impact are different according to each region and territory. The design of policies, instructions, governance is indispensable to be able to contribute with actions that mitigate these actions and climate change. We invite everybody to check the IPCC report on climate change and grounds presented by Thermacru. Vice President of the Intergovernmental Panel of the UN on Climate Change, IPCC. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, good night. Y bienvenidos a la sesión donde voy a presentar. Good morning, everyone, once again. De parte de la IPCC, realmente es un placer tenerlos a todos aquí en esta sesión donde voy a presentar algunos de los hallazgos claves en el informe especial de cambio climático y terrenos. Ahora voy a dar un poco de información de fondo. Siguiente. Ahora, en cada ciclo de IPCC, que dura 6, 7 años, los Estados miembros y las organizaciones observadores son invitadas a presentar sus vistas y visiones sobre posibles futuros informes. Se producen dos informes especiales cada ciclo. Hay muchas sugerencias que a veces se agrupan en nueve temas. La última vez, tierra, ciudades y océanos. Un especial informe de cambio climático y tierra es el segundo clúster más grande y cubre seis propuestas de Estados miembros y organizaciones observadoras. El informe especial de terreno explora cómo la forma en que utilizamos nuestra tierra contribuye al cambio climático y cómo el cambio climático afecta nuestra tierra. El título del informe en su versión expandida es un informe especial IPCC, Cambio Climático, Desertificación, Degradación de la Tierra, Gestión Sostenible de la Tierra, Seguridad Alimentaria y Flujos de Gases de Infecto Invernadero en los Ecosistemas Terrestres. Como pueden ver, aúna muchos conceptos de desertificación, degradación de la Tierra, desertificación, flujos de gases de efecto invernadero que han sido tratados en estos capítulos especiales del informe. Siguiente. Así que... Tenemos informes de científicos líderes, de 107 autores, 53% de los autores fueron de países en desarrollo, logrando que este informe de IPCC tener más autores de países en vías de desarrollo que los países desarrollados. desarrollados. 40% de las mujeres eran líderes en coordinación de los capítulos. Se evaluó más de 7.000 publicaciones científicas con más de 28.000 comentarios de los expertos revisores. Esta diapositiva muestra los siete informes, los siete capítulos del informe y que muestra los vínculos entre la desertificación, degradación de tierra, seguridad alimentaria y gases de infecto invernadero. Capítulo 6. Ahora, ¿qué es nuevo en este informe? En este informe se entrega un análisis más integrado de los conductores directos e indirectos de la gestión de recursos de la degradación de tierra del punto de vista de seguridad alimentaria y se refiere a las fuertes correlaciones entre la degradación de tierra y la pobreza. 
En esta diapositiva se destacan los hallazgos de alto nivel del informe. La Tierra está bajo presión. La Tierra es parte de la solución. Pero también la Tierra no puede hacerlo todo por sí sola. En las siguientes cuatro diapositivas vemos cómo se continúa con este mensaje. La Tierra es un recurso fundamental y nosotros dependemos de ella para obtener alimentos, agua, salud y bienestar, pero ya se encuentra bajo una creciente presión humana y el cambio climático está agregando a estas presiones. Está haciendo una situación ya desafiante, peor, y está socavando la seguridad alimentaria. Agricultura, deforestación, producción alimentaria son los grandes conductores del cambio climático. La tierra que ya estamos usando podría alimentar el mundo en un cambio climático y puede proporcionar vía masa para energía no renovable, pero requiere de acciones extendidas de gran alcance en varios frentes. Estas son cosas que podemos hacer para mejorar la adaptación y combatir el cambio climático y la degradación de las tierras. La acción coordinada para abordar el cambio climático simultáneamente puede mejorar la tierra, seguridad alimentaria, nutrición y ayudar a acabar con el hambre. Sabemos que estas acciones están disponibles que pueden simultáneamente mejorar el, la tierra, mejorar la seguridad alimentaria y mejorar la nutrición. La forma en que producimos nuestros alimentos sí importa y las opciones dietéticas pueden reducir las emisiones y la presión sobre la tierra. Siguiente. Una mejor gestión de tierra puede desempeñar un papel importante en la lucha contra el cambio climático, pero no puede hacerlo todo. El reducir los gases de efecto invernadero de todos los sectores es esencial para mantener el calentamiento por debajo de los 2 grados Celsius y también la gestión de la tierra puede también apoyar esto. Ahora voy a dar algunos de los hallazgos de los capítulos 1 y 2. Esta diapositiva da algunos puntos destacados de interacciones entre tierra y clima. Uno, que el calentamiento de la tierra es 1.53 grados Celsius mayor que el promedio del calentamiento global del 2006 al 2015. Y esto tiene impactos observables. Por ejemplo, temperaturas mayores con patrones de precipitación cambiantes. Realmente ha cambiado las los climas y temporadas ha reducido la disponibilidad de agua fresca y ha puesto la biodiversidad con mayor estrés. El gráfico muestra el uso extendido de la tierra y la apropiación de servicios y ecosistemas. Aparte de la pérdida de biodiversidad, tiene, está sin precedentes en la historia humana crecimiento de población y mayor demanda de múltiples servicios ecosistémicos muestran que esto va a continuar a futuro y esto está vinculado directamente al uso de la tierra y puede amplificar un ambiente mayor y desafíos mayores sobre la tierra. Ahora hay impactos directos negativos sobre los ecosistemas y los servicios que ellos entregan. Voy a detenerme aquí para empezar con la siguiente. Hacer cumplir, actuar inmediatamente sobre estos conductores podría mejorar la seguridad alimentaria, invertir la degradación de tierra sin poner en riesgo los beneficios obtenidos en la tierra. Y número 5, restringir el calentamiento por debajo de los 2 grados Celsius reduciría en gran medida los impactos negativos del cambio climático sobre la tierra, pero esto involucra grandes reducciones antropogénicas en los gases de efecto invernadero. Algunas opciones aumentarían la competencia por la tierra, generando desafíos sociales. La competencia por la tierra puede aumentar 
el, los precios alimentarios y aumentar la desertificación en referencia a uso de fertilizantes y agua con implicancias para el agua y la contaminación aérea y la pérdida mayor de biodiversidad. Estas consecuencias ponen en peligro la capacidad de la sociedad de lograr muchas de las metas de desarrollo sostenible y sustentable que dependen de la tierra. En, consecuentemente, las tendencias ecológicas han sumado entre un 22 a 33 por ciento en los últimos dos a tres décadas, incluyendo a China, Norteamérica, Brasil y otras áreas. Y esto es debido a un rango de factores que están directamente e indirectamente vinculados a las actividades humanas. Por ejemplo, gestión de uso de tierras, expansión de bosques, calentamiento global, entre otros. Y también hay proyecciones de ondas de calor en mayor frecuencia, intensidad y duración en la mayor parte del mundo. La variabilidad futura del clima se espera que va a aumentar el riesgo y la severidad de los incendios en, por ejemplo, los bosques tropicales, en la agricultura y silvicultura, que se conoce como AFULU en esta presentación, produce 22% de las emisiones antropogénicas, que incluye el CO2, dióxido de carbono, entre otros. Ahora, en los flujos de CO2 entre la Tierra y la atmósfera, es muy probable que tenga una eliminación de este gas, que puede eliminar este gas en las últimas décadas. Aquí vemos varias opciones de mitigación que no aumentan la competencia por la tierra, por ejemplo, el aumento de la productividad alimentaria, reducción de las pérdidas post cosecha, reducción de la degradación forestal. Muchas de estas opciones tienen beneficios que son parte de lo que conlleva la adaptación al cambio climático. El uso de terreno es un cuarto de la producción de los gases de efecto invernadero, los ecosistemas toman y producen algunas opciones de mitigación en reducir las emisiones terrestres, especialmente la, el CO2, de la deforestación, metano, de el ganado y también uso de fertilizante. Cambios en el comportamiento de consumidores, por ejemplo, reducir el consumo general de alimentos y energía podría beneficiar la reducción de los gases de efecto invernadero terrestres. Pero hay barreras en implementar las opciones de adaptación y mitigación, por ejemplo, instituciones financieras, barreras financieras, acceso a incentivos, acceso a tecnología relevante, conocimiento del consumidor escalas limitadas que también afectan estos métodos y prácticas. Así que la práctica del informe destaca la importancia de inclusividad de género para la gestión sostenible y sustentable de terreno. Las mujeres juegan un gran rol en la agricultura y la economía global. El reconocer los derechos de terreno de las mujeres y traer su conocimiento en las decisiones sobre tierras podría apoyar el alivio de degradación de tierra y facilitar una adaptación integrada y medidas de mitigación. Pero hay una falta de coordinación a través de niveles de gobierno, por ejemplo, los transnacionales, locales, regionales, en abordar los cambios climáticos una cartera de instrumentos de políticas de varios sectores del gobierno podría abordar los desafíos climáticos y de tierra. Por ejemplo, la gobernanza que considera los derechos de mujeres y personas indígenas de mejorar su uso de tierra, compartir los recursos de tierra, seguridad alimentaria y aumentos del conocimiento del uso de tierra que puede aumentar las oportunidades de adaptación y mitigación. Hay una gran variabilidad en la disponibilidad en uso de recursos terrestres entre regiones, 
países y sistemas de gestión de tierra. Adicionalmente, las diferencias en las condiciones socioeconómicas como riqueza, instituciones y gobernanza afecta la capacidad de responder al cambio climático para la inseguridad alimentaria, desertificación, degradación de tierra. También hay respuestas que son afectadas por los dueños locales de tierras. El cambio climático va a afectar regiones y comunidades de forma distinta. Esta diapositiva da algunos resultados del capítulo 2, indicando que las emisiones en bruto de Ofolu es un tercio de las emisiones globales aquí, son las emisiones totales en bruto. Este número es más indicativo de la potencial de mitigación en reducir la deforestación y también números que tienen que ver con la compensación de deforestación, por ejemplo. La tierra es 61% de las emisiones de metano antropogénicas y esto es un estudio entre el 2005 y 2015. Las áreas de pastoreo, humedales y la expansión de las arroceras son algo que afecta a la tendencia actual. Hay una acumulación significativa de emisiones de metano en la atmósfera. 50% del nitrógeno aplicado a las tierras de agrícolas no es absorbida por el cultivo, lo que genera emisiones de heredoso y es una de las grandes fuentes de este tipo de gas debido al uso de fertilizantes. Las tierras de pastoreo son responsables de más de un tercio de las emisiones antropogénicas totales de n 2 y la mitad de las emisiones agrícolas. Error de una cuarta parte de la mitigación prometida en los acuerdos de París proviene de la mitigación terrestre. Hay una reducción que se refiere a la deforestación y bosques. Algunos se refieren a la secuestración de carbono, agricultura y bioenergía. Los grandes potenciales de reducir las emisiones a flu es reducir la deforestación, degradación de bosques, un cambio hacia dietas vegetarianas y reducir los desechos. También existen los efectos de la forestación, deforestación, la bioenergía, la secuestración de carbono, entre otros. Los escenarios de mitigación incluyen la reducción de mitigación en otros sectores y también metas estrictas, por ejemplo, el 1,5 depende más fuertemente de la mitigación terrestre, especialmente dióxido de carbono en su eliminación, lo que se trató en el informe de 1,5 de calentamiento global. En torno a muchos escenarios, el 2100 se ve la reducción de dióxido de carbono es limitado por el calentamiento global y requiere una conversión de grandes áreas de tierra para forestación, reforestación y cultivos bioenergéticos, además de cambios dietéticos, evitando el uso de productos de ganado. Y limitarlo al 1,5 a 2 grados Celsius requiere una conversión de grandes áreas de tierra para la forestación, reforestación y cultivos bioenergéticos. Esto puede conllevar a reducciones de dióxido de carbono en el corto plazo sin tener que tener, por ejemplo, escenarios que dependan más de las emisiones de reducción rápida, los BEX y otros sectores. Siguiente diapositiva. Hay algunos hallazgos en el capítulo 3 y 4 que aborda la desertificación y luego la de desertificación, la degradación respectivamente. Hay diferentes alcances e intensidades. La desertificación ha aumentado en las últimas décadas. Esta desertificación ya ha reducido la, produ la productividad de la agricultura y los resultados o ingresos, contribuyendo a la pérdida de biodiversidad en áreas más desérticas en muchas 
las plantas y la expansión de las tierras de cultivo han ejercido una presión insostenible de la tierra por el crecimiento de la población. Además, vemos que los principales impulsores de la desertificación son la expansión de las tierras de cultivo, la gestión la insustentable de las tierras y además el cambio climático se va a exacerbar en los diferentes procesos y aumentará los riesgos. La desertificación y el cambio climático reducirá la prestación de los servicios de los ecosistemas en los ecosistemas incluidas las pérdidas de biodiversidad, la desertificación y el cambio climático se proyectan provocar pérdidas en la productividad de industrias ganaderas y reducir también biodiversidad biológica en las tierras. Próxima. En cuanto a la degradación de la tierra, se ve negativamente afectando la, el modo de vida de las personas, afecta a las personas en los ecosistemas en todo el planeta y está mayormente afectado por el cambio climático y además contribuye al cambio climático. Los cambios en el uso de la tierra y los cambios de la tierra sustentable están directamente relacionados. La agricultura es un sector dominante que está impulsando la degradación. El cambio climático además exacerba la magnitud creciente de los procesos de degradación de la tierra y el calentamiento global más allá del de presente va a exacerbar aún más, va a agravar los procesos generando mayor, mayores eh, intensificaciones en los ciclones, también inundaciones y otros desastres naturales. En la, permafrost debido al calentamiento y la erosión por el aumento del nivel del mar van a afectar muchos lugares que, lo, donde generalmente no ha habido un problema. La degradación de la tierra también es un impulsor mediante la emisión de gases de efecto invernadero y la reducción de la absorción de carbono, la deforestación, los incendios forestales, la degradación de los suelos y permafrost contribuyen mayormente al cambio climático por la emisión de gases de, de efecto invernadero y los sumideros de carbono que siguen a la deforestación para gestionar los, los bosques y la gestión de estos, tiene como resultado gas de efecto invernadero en algunos casos, la tierra y su degradación pueden ser evitados implementando restauración sustentable y prácticas de rehabilitación. Las medidas para evitar y reducir esto están disponibles y además son barreras económicas, sociales, incluyendo la falta de acceso al conocimiento y la falta de opciones para abordar la degradación de las tierras. Van a aumentar las emisiones y los sumideros de carbono. Además de ser incompatible con las reducciones de emisiones necesarias para limitar el calentamiento global a 1 o más 5. Esto puede llevarnos a resultados biológicos y humanos irreversibles. Las opciones pueden generar un beneficio inmediato a las comunidades afectadas por la degradación de la tierra y contribuir a beneficios de largo plazo de mitigación ante el cambio climático. Con la, adecu con la adecuada implementación de acciones se puede revertir la degradación va a haber degradación residual igualmente en algunos sectores. Continúan las incertidumbres sobre la gravedad y su vínculo de la degradación con el cambio climático. Sigue habiendo brechas de información importantes. Esta diapositiva nos indica que hay límites en la capacidad para poder prevenir y revertir la desertificación y también la degradación de la tierra. Por ejemplo, cuando la desertificación da como resultado la pérdida absoluta de la productividad de la tierra y donde las opciones limitadas existen para abordar, por ejemplo, la erosión costera, 
el deshielo del permafrost y la erosión extrema del suelo. También el límite es la capacidad de los sistemas terrestres para actuar como sumideros de carbono. Por ejemplo, cuando la vegetación madura y los reservorios de carbono alcanzan puntos de saturación o cuando los eventos climáticos o la mala gestión terrestre tienen un impacto en los sistemas. Ahora pasando al capítulo 5 que aborda la seguridad alimentaria, esta diapositiva nos muestra que aproximadamente 821 millones de personas están desnutridas y todo esto incluye todo el ciclo de la alimentación que se ve bajo presión por el crecimiento de los ingresos y la población y la demanda de productos de origen animal y además el cambio climático. El cambio climático ya está afectando la seguridad mediante el aumento de las temperaturas, los cambios en los patrones de precipitación y la frecuencia de algunos eventos extremos. Y esta situación continuará. En estos estresantes factores de estrés, Vemos un impacto en la seguridad, disponibilidad, utilización y estabilidad de los alimentos. El aumento de las temperaturas afecta la productividad de la agricultura en latitudes mayores. Podremos ver impactos en el algodón, trigo y otros cultivos, maíz, que están disminuyendo en regiones de menor latitud. Acerca de un 25 a 30% de las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero se atribuyen al sistema alimentario. Sin intervención, es probable que esto aumente de un 30 a un 40% hasta el 2050 debido al aumento de la demanda basándonos en la población y crecimiento de la población y cambios dietarios. Las prácticas del lado de la oferta pueden ayudar a mitigar el cambio climático reduciendo las emisiones de los cultivos y del ganado, absorbiendo carbono en los suelos y biomasa y disminuyendo la intensidad de las emisiones dentro de los sistemas de producción sustentables. Algunas opciones se tienen gran potencial de mitigación, como el secuestro de carbono y las emisiones de óxido nitroso de los fertilizantes y otros. El consumo de dietas más balanceadas presenta grandes oportunidades para reducir las emisiones en los sistemas alimentarios, como también la reducción de pérdidas de alimentos y desperdicio de alimentos. Este cambio depende de las, las opciones de los consumidores y las opciones dietarias, que están derivadas de factores culturales, de gobernanza, de mercados, entre otros. Ahora llegamos a las últimas diapositivas de los capítulos 6 y 7. Los desafíos relacionados con la tierra y las opciones varían de acuerdo a la región y el contexto y son limitadas por el tipo de tierra, la región climática o el contexto de alimentación local. Algunas pueden producir efectos adver adversos en algunas regiones y contextos. Por ejemplo, en regiones en donde el agua llega para las tierras, se puede, el uso de, el, el uso de agua fresca puede no tener eh, resultados o impactos desastrosos, pero donde el agua es escasa puede que se afecte la agricultura. Y puede la mayoría de las opciones aplicarse sin competir por la tierra disponible, por ejemplo, las bioenergías y también la bioenergía con captura y almacenamiento de carbono tienen un gran potencial de mitigación, pero dependen de la escala. Los, uh, los efectos de la degradación de la tierra pueden ser escasez de alimentos, degradación de la tierra y biodiversidad y la escasez del agua, pero depende de la escala del despliegue, del despliegue, de las medidas, de la bioenergía, de las regiones climáticas y otros factores. Próxima diapositiva. Los cambios en las temperaturas globales tienen impactos en la tierra y pueden tener como resultado también riesgos compuestos para los sistemas alimentarios, la salud humana, y de los ecosistemas, los medios de vida, la viabilidad de la infraestructura y el valor de la tierra. Estos pueden variar de acuerdo a la región. 
los riesgos relacionados con la degradación de la tierra, la desertificación y la seguridad alimentaria aumentan la temperatura, pueden revertir los avances del desarrollo en algunas las respuestas terrestres, incluyendo en Sudamérica, son particularmente vulnerables a las disminuciones en la producción terrestre. Vemos las políticas que aborda la pobreza, la degradación y las emisiones que pueden lograr un desarrollo sustentable resiliente al clima. Las consecuencias son una presión aumentada en la tierra con riesgo de la falla y sin un exceso de temperatura en la transferencia de la mitigación y permitir luchar contra el cambio climático en las futuras generaciones. Esta mínima dependencia en la CDR disminuye el riesgo de la mitigación. Se puede cambiar también la carga al sector terrestre que aumentaría los riesgos, incluyendo los efectos adversos sobre la seguridad alimentaria y los servicios de los ecosistemas. Es que con esto, muchas gracias por escuchar mi presentación. Hay mucha información, pero creí que era positivo reunir todos los diferentes mensajes. Espero que sean útiles para los diálogos consiguientes en la conferencia. Muchas gracias. The report just presented by the Vice President of the IPCC is uh, what is goes exactly before the presentation of the panel. Frances Jose Vasquez from Cuba, author of the IPCC in Havana University, with a degree in physics to physics and environment and territorial ordainment since 1984. He works in the Institute of Meteorology in the Ministry of Science and Environment in Cuba, specialist in agricultural meteorology and systems of geographic. Uh, he's a collaborator of the, Ge in the geography faculty of Havana University, Tania Liu. Climate change and environment policy officer in with FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean. She has a master's in hydrology from the Delft University and a master's in conservation of biodiversity from West Indies University in Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome. Also joining us in this panel is Ros Rocio Santa Madrigal, executive director of Tremendas Foundation and international community of youth and children working for two years now. They just spent their anniversary around and they work around climate change sociologists working particularly in childhood gender issues and social innovation welcome rocio and from peru so joining us is adrian waman member of the community center malco washi tequeros when thinking we're thinking the pachamama is the basis of their life philosophy working for so many years and gaining strength now in recent times. Uh, Adrián is in Puno, south from Titicaca Lake with some connection issues. So we hope that he can connect at some point during this session, but we will obviously be waiting for him when he can join us. Uh, now moderating is Maria Jose Martinez, doctor in science. Conservation of Biodiversity, Queensland University in Australia, and a researcher, associate researcher from Universidad de Chile and Milenio Institute, and the Institute of Ecology, Applied Ecology and Sustainability. Her specialist specialties are the study of ecosystem, ecological systems for conservation of biodiversity of ecosystemic environments. And now, Maria Jose, uh, you can lead. The floor is yours to lead this panel. Thank you so much, Marisol. Good afternoon and welcome to this panel on desertification. Well, the changes in global temperatures have an impact on the land and result in compound risks for element for food systems, the health of ecosystems and the humans and biodiversity and also the livelihoods and viability of infrastructure and the value of land. Desertification and degradation in desertic lands 
comes from the interaction and action of several factors, including human activities, climate variations, which are exacerbated and an increased for climate from climate change, which is relevant because it could impact the reduction of the continuous supply of ecosystemic services that the lands, the desertic lands provide. And it could also affect in the degradation of these ecosystems and the loss of health of this ecosystem, including losses in biodiversity. This panel seeks to emphasize on actions and experiences at a regional level based on both in innovation, scientific innovation, and local and traditional knowledge that could be taken so as to address the certification and decrease the land degradation, also make assuring food security, bring in social, economic, and development benefits to contribute to eradicating poverty, and also to build more resilient livelihoods particularly those that are most vulnerable. So the goal of this panel will be to address these experiences the more uh, in the regional context to reduce and revert these effects of desertification for mitigating the effects of climate change and also to find solutions of adaptability based on a regional perspective. Now we'll move to the presentations. We'll start with Ramses Jose Vasquez. Good afternoon, everyone. Please, before starting, allow me to offer my wor the warmest of thanks uh, for the invitation. I will try to comment a little on what my country is doing to adaptate to climate change. As a first idea, let's see something about Cuba and the problem of climate change. For Cuba, facing climate change is a high priority. The area depends, and we have an insular state located in the tropical area of the planet. So this, the climate change has made more severe our issues now being a determining factor in sustainable development. Now, in relation to the agreement, we offer a summary of the circumstances. I will briefly comment that in the past years, we have observed important changes with the major evidences being the increase of the annual temperature condition by the increase of minimal temperature, decrease of the clouds, more intense droughts, increase in rainfall over 50 millimeters and a higher influence of cycles. Now, we sustain the hypothesis that in Cuba we're transitioning to a state with characteristics similar to an intensified greenhouse effect area. Now, as a following aspect, we can delve into what is related to desertification. It, many years ago, the project to assess land degradation in arid areas, so to apply the methodology to assess and quantify nature, the extent and causes generating the land degradation in dry areas and what was necessary to uh, address the situation, Cuba, along with other countries, joined to face the situation. In studies performed contributing to validity, Cuba detected an increase of 100,000 dry lands. And as a result, we see the contrast with the benchmark periods from 61 to 90 and 61 to 90. We see the increasing trend from dry lands to the present with the, an annual progress of 0.1% of the total national territory concentrating said impact in the southwest of the region. If we see the desertification as a degradation of the dry areas, all of this affected by processes in other parts of the territory, we understand that the causes of degradation are multiple. As a legal basis, Cuba had designed a strategy, a national strategy and an action plan nationwide to fight desertification and drought. We 
see the main causes of desertification, the inadequate establishment of crops and plantations, the inadequate management of technology, in a proper use of land, among others. The general objective of the national strategy is to prevent and control the cost of contributing to the development of processes that lead to desertification through the application of practical measures that are necessary and adequate, allowing to stop or revert these processes, mitigating the effects of drought and contributing to the sustainable development of the affected areas with the goal of improving the livelihood of inhabitants. The Factors of this program are the following, Pro economic and social development of the affected areas by processes leading to desertification, the perfectioning in the application of legal and administrative processes or instruments to control and set the basis of the program, the establishment and coordination of policies and strategies, information and environmental education of citizens and their participation, scientific education, the strengthening of the institutions and international cooperation. The program of national action besides trying to stop the degradation of land and loss of biodiversity is a part of the object of the agenda of the sustainable development goals and Cuba is committed to this process and the influence in the environment, natural resources, biodiversity, food security, and the economy of the country are at stake. Along with the previous programs there in the country, a series of programs in development that are synergic and favor the process to achieve what it has been called the neutrality of the degradation of the Cuban lands. Among them, we can hide the national program against uh, drought and desertification, the program to monitor land program of biological units, national program of reforestation, national program of hydrographic um, basins, urban and family or land planning, uh, program of organic and fertilizers and and on other schemes of territorial ordainment. As a manager of these programs, are led by the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Environment, as, along with the Agency of Environment, we have the state plan to face climate change called Tarea Viva. It is the express will of the Cuban government to address the affairs related to climate change. In this plan, we have five strategic actions and several tasks, among which the strategic action number three speaks about the adaptation of um, agricultural practices, uh, changing the use of land as a consequence of the sea level rise and drought. The strategic action number four is, explains that we must address the reduction of the crops near coasts affected by marine intrusion and then diversifying the crops, improving the conditions of the lands, producing varieties that are resistant to the new temperature changes, among others. Uh, so under the premise that the current climate problems can commit the social development and economical goals of the country unless they're duly tackled, the facing the climate change is decisive to be able to achieve sustainability. The, uh, ho the focus is comprehensive because it focuses on the vulnerability and the past risks that are observed and expected in the variability and or climate change where each sector and institution plays an important role according to the task in the collective acting that overcomes borders and that gives tasks to different sectors to be able to achieve a new knowledge that goes beyond the sectorial outreach and institutional scope. So now, if you allow me, I can offer an example of this. Let's see. So as an example of this, synergies that have been previously mentioned is the creation of the baseline for the neutrality of land degradation as the plan to establish the goals for neutrality in the analysis, the construction of a baseline for land neutrality. If you have three base indicators, the coverage, the land organic carbon, 
the physical advisements uh, and metrics for the UN and the stats obtained by the effects of the support program in the establishment of goals for land neutrality. Nevertheless, we have expanded on this with the later information. The baseline was defined for 2020 because it's the one that has the greatest amount of information for the projects national and international and the critical areas. So summarizing, I would conclude that this focus of neutrality of the degradation of land for decision-making aligned to the new governmental demands in the forming of society has given us a better follow-up in land use in the state and the ecosystemic services, the baseline or reference base for 2050 of the degradation of land based on the basic indic indicators on land neutrality calculates and approves the process towards the constitution of goals that will allow us to achieve neutrality in land degradation for 2030. The results indicated indicate at least 35% of the country, that's over 3 million and fraction hectares, present some level of degradation in an advanced way between the year 2000 and 2015. We have 16 critical points in degradation, which are distributed throughout the country. The work for the identification of the national goals for the neutrality and land degradation has had the integration of the new goals for the country for the year 2030. This has allowed us to have neutrality of the degradation of lands that contribute to the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals, the social development of the country, and the development of the state to, to tackle climate change, and also the goals and the programs that are being developed in the country and the future projects that are for transformation are the paths to take for the adjustment of projects and public policies that will reduce and reverse the degraded lands in the country and then that way achieve neutrality and land degradation for the year 2030. And this is the end of my presentation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramses. Very interesting to get to know the Cuban case as a reference in searching for solutions and in certification. So it's interesting to have a strategy that is implemented on the national level against desertification to prevent the causes and processes that create desertification to contribute to different well being aspects. So the next presentation. We're going to give the floor to Tanya Yu so she can tell us about the experience she has to talk about. Yes, thank you very much. I'm going to wait for the presentation to come online. Okay, we have the presentation. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. I'd like to invite, I'd like to thank the organization for inviting me. I'm an officer from the FAO of, of the of climate change and policies. Now I'd like to show that Australia has a great natural capital. A third of our global lands are already degraded. So, so it's is essential, especially when we talk about desertification for a large growth. It's estimated that the agricultural potential of our region is close to 800 million hectares in the earth and in natural resources, Latin America is one of the richest areas in the world with 23% of the lands that can potentially 
be harvested or used for agriculture from the worlds. So the next slide. In this, we see the degradation or desertification of a, a lagoon in the metropolitan region in Chile. It's one of the impacts and examples of the use of land and degradation in this region. 23% of our lands are degraded due to the large threats and it affects their functions, putting the ecosystemic services in danger. The change in use of the land produces the emission of billions of tons of carbon dioxide. And the region represents 14% of the world degradation of land of a maximum of 26% of the lands affected in Mesoamerica and South America. It reaches a 14% main causes of degradation are the erosion of water, deforestation, monocultivation, agriculture that causes a loss of biodiversification and biodiversity in many cases. So in this slide, what I wanted to show you was a little bit of the case of Chile. For example, the scarce hydro resources in Chile and the various climates show an irregular availability of hydric resources. For example, there is a greater availability in the south compared to the north of Chile. For example, in November 2020, there were 79 municipalities that had a hydro scarcity in 2019. All the rivers reported on by the General Water Department showed lesser flows than their historical flows and also their growing demand of hydro resources. That in Chile, there's a use that's concentrated in three sectors, agriculture, 70% of potable urban water, and then the industrial sector. All of this with the overuse of resources has resulted in water scarcity in some communities, mostly rural and indigenous. According to some publications of the FAO, there are many things on land degradation. For example, the world population is more and more urbanized, and it's expected that the regions will be further urbanized for 2050, that 70% of the world population will be urban. So. Here we see agriculture that represents 70% of the total use of water in the world. The other, as we said before, is climate change that impacts everything, the grounds and the uncertainty in the trends related to ecosystemic services. Also, Latin America and the Caribbean is one of the most emerging areas of the world, especially affected by the pandemic in the social, economical, and environmental areas. The world crisis due to COVID highlights the urgency in closing the gaps and guaranteeing a more resilient agricultural and sustainable agricultural sector. And to continue with some of the actions of the AAO in our region, there are some actions, for example, that with the Jeff projects or in Panama, we're carrying out a project and it requires a framework and decision-making. Also the replication of good practices, sustainable management, sustainable land use, hydro resources also, for example, another topic, the mapping of zones with the potential of organic carbon sequestering, which are 
positive element and also through the analysis of data, interpretation, mapping, we seek to promote a follow-up of a period of 20 years while we adopt sustainable management policies and practices. There also are other projects with 18 countries of the region to be able to map this ground or land data, especially in the capture of carbon in grounds. Other projects with the Green Climate Funds are the Red Plus projects that tackle the reduction of emissions. We have a project in Colombia, for example, where it's estimated that they were going to manage it in a sustainable way. 60,000 forest hectares with the active participation of the indigenous peoples through the pilot program. And also we have another project, for example, in Chile, also in Red Plus, that is estimated in a reduction of carbon dioxide of 1.1 million tons in reduction. Furthermore, we have to highlight that the management and resilience that FAO is performing in Latin America between 2005 and 2015 showed the losses in agriculture and livestock use, losses in millions of dollars and droughts were one of the main causes of this. Up to 83% of all economical losses caused by the documented drought. And according to the FAO study, this was due to agriculture with $29 million in losses. I think this is the last one. Yes. And finally, I wanted to highlight that on behalf of FAO, the collaboration and exchange of knowledge, lessons learned, dialogues among various countries in the region is very important. And we have two platforms to execute this where FAO can give its support. The first one is the Global Soil Partnership. And we have a chapter in our region, which is called ASNIC, the Alliance of Grounds in Latin America, ASLAC. It has its objective in knowledge and information and the various environmental factors that affect the countries. And the other platform launched in COP25 December 2019. It was an initiative of the government of Chile for the first year. Chile was called to share this platform. The objective of PLACA is to support the collaboration of countries in the region with initiatives, platforms, institutions for the implementation of mitigation measures and adaptation measures to support regional strategies and national strategies. And I believe that would be the last slide. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. Very interesting to get to know all the initiatives by FAO. Can you hear me? Well then, I have a question from the audience for Tanya. Tanya, what direction should public policies take to protect that 79 municipalities and millions of Chileans affected by the hydro scarcity or water shortage? Can you give us some action examples that the FAO has held in the region? Yes, okay. So one of those projects with the Climate Fund is to prepare some actions, which is called adaptation, national adaptation plans. With these adaptation plans, we use it to support the government and to plan with scientific data what the priorities are for adaptation and mitigation to mitigate climate change not just for the hydro 
or water shortage, but also degradation of lands. And one of these plans of adaptation is also to prepare an action plan, right, for the base and level communities, et cetera, not just on the government national level, but also to work in all of these levels with the communities as well to be more, let's say, active and proactive. And we have some of these solutions that can be seen in the native communities and the farming communities. So these are being prepared and almost an implementation in Chile. Thank you. Now, let's go to Rocio, who is Rocio Santa Madrigal, who will tell us about her experience. Well, thank you very much, Maria Jose. As was mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Tremendas Foundation, which I'll tell you a little more about what the foundation does, what we do together with the youth and what our experience has been in involving ourselves and trying to stop climate change and mitigate its effects. So first of all, I'd like to thank this opportunity to have these spaces where scientific knowledge can be found with the citizen knowledge and local management and to talk about a more local native knowledge. These all are important spaces. And also, I'd like to talk a little bit about that Fundacion Tremendas is a foundation that works with adolescents between 12 and 25 years of age. What we want to do is to make visible the talent of these youth. And this is done with projects that have social impact, that seek social justice, climate justice, and gender equality mainly. We're focused on these 17 sustainable development goals. So we have a type of sustainable development cross-cutting objective and environmental objective. So in that framework, we have focused on education. We want education to be the engine for change. We want it to be the change for society that takes us towards this future of climate justice. So in that sense, we've developed an education academy. It may sound a little bit grandiose, a little bit ambitious, but we've had an academy called Climaticas where we've articulated different social organizations, different stakeholders in society that are experts in certain topics, and we've articulated knowledge to make this come closer to the youth in the different communities. And there are different factors where we can highlight the impact we've had, because first of all, we work with young women and adolescents. So we have two main characteristics in our public and our objectives. It's the gender, also the age. All these are factors that have had help marginalize these people, especially from intervention and action arenas. So what we do is that through this academy, we empower them as agents of change. And we do this through this environmental education. It's very important to notice that this environmental education is very similar to what Fundacion Medi does. It's to consider and think outside of the box on what education is. It's to break the traditional walls of traditional education. It's to bring knowledge closer to the day to day. So in that sense, we seek that the students, climate students can find solutions to the problems they find in their day to day aspects. So we believe it's a comprehensive search for solutions because this environmental education goes beyond mentioning the causes and effects of climate change. We want the women and girls to see in all their areas what climate change means in their life, the increase of temperature of the planet, deforestation, desertification, impacts on the oceans. And the seeking of solutions is done through project management and 
we want for these girls to be agents of change in their own communities and develop comprehensive solutions, as I was telling you, for local problems. These actions have been an amazing experience because we managed to connect with over 600 girls from the Latin American Caribbean area from over 12 countries with a national quota, of course, because we need to acknowledge the participation of everyone. And we had a huge impact with over 900 requests, but we had to uh, cut that at 600 because we were um, aware of our capabilities. But mainly what I wanted to let you know through all of this is the importance of promoting environmental education beyond knowledge, this technical scientific knowledge. We need to transfer this knowledge to different education systems for these new generations that want to be a part of this change that promote social justice and believe in a different world. So it's important that we know how to connect the knowledge with action. And through this platform of the climate agencies and Clementas Foundation, we have managed to convey the message that knowledge to the youth and also connecting the knowledge of experts, as I was telling you, with this more uh, daily knowledge of the youth. And an important part to consider is that all of this complements with a digital digital platform of personal actions where girls register every action they take, uh, that every eco-friendly action they take during the day. So that has, that translates into a CO2 emission. So by the end of a week, these people can know the direct impact they had in the emission of greenhouse gases. So what we want to promote with this is the management through changing routines, management through the involvement of the different sectors, the different stakeholders and actors in society. We strongly believe that solutions to such a multifactorial problems as climate change needs to have intersectoral solutions and multi-agent solutions. If we leave one part of the society aside, we won't get anywhere and we'll move slower. So I would like to thank now Fundacion Medi for opening up these spaces and allowing us to know the experiences from others, other countries, other studies, other knowledge that sometimes escape us and present in spaces that are uh, airtight. And to open up these experiences, these instances is fundamental. So I thank for the coordination and the invitation. And as I told you, we're aiming for those multi-agent intersectoral solutions. Always consider that the youth is the present and uh, it's uh, we are done with that speed that, that the new generations are the future because the youth, these generations are the present, the here and now, and they have a lot to say. They are hungry for change and they're acting for the changes they want to see, which is important. So they are, you're all invited to follow us uh, on our different social media, Fundacion Tremendas, and uh, um, also available for questions. Thank you so much, Rocio. It was very interesting. We'll all be following Tremendas Foundation with such important work of female empowerment also. And as Thelma said in the beginning, gender inclusion could also improve the sustainable management of the land together with environmental education. Uh, they act in synergy as an important solution. So I have a question both for, well, this one is for Rocio, but also for Tania. What real space do you see so that the youth can traction and have a contraction and effect in matters of public policies to mitigate climate change collaboratively? Collaboratively, this is. Would you like to start, Rocio? Yes, perfect. Well, as I mentioned before, it's really important to consider the multiple agents that 
the climate crisis that we're living today has in that line, uh, we also believe, and I believe, that it's important to consider the youth, young people, in the creation of public policies, as you're stating. And this needs to be done, however, in different spaces. There should be a youth committee separate from the decision-making spaces, uh, is uh, counterproducing. It, it is not the, the path. The, the youth are considered uh, as part of a checklist, but there needs to be active listening and binding listening. So these spaces should be open for the youth and adolescents. They should be directly involved in the decision-making processes. There could also be a background and more in-depth preparation of students that are involved. We can prepare them so that they know what is being discussed so that they can talk to authorities with the proper knowledge. But I think it is fundamental for them to be involved in this decision-making process to have this basis where they can actually participate because if we see the present and the current reality, there's no such thing that makes both parties converge and this environmental discussion beyond the traditional aspects need to include the scientific knowledge on one side but also understand the multifactorial nature of this phenomenon so that we can see climate change in every aspect and not understanding it as an isolated issue with one solution and one possible way excellent thank you Tania, do you have something to, to say about this instances, this spaces? Yes, yes, of course. I know that this is not an easy topic for, for the youth to be really involved in the matters of climate change and decision making, but just to emphasize this idea, all organizations of the UN have a strategy involving young people and all gender all genders in this topic so i would like to emphasize that in all of the climate change dialogues discussions cop 26 this year or the pre cop pre cop dialogues there they include spaces for youth so i would like to all the students to join us. Uh, you can find the information on the websites and you can make the most of these instances with all of this COVID <laughs> happening and all of these conferences like this one. Everything, everything is open for them. With COP at the moment, we, we don't have any certainty that the COP will be hold it, held in person or if it's going to be online. And if it's going to be online, it would be a tremendous opportunity for everyone to join, to participate. That's it. Thank you. Are we on the air? Okay, perfect. Well, Maria Jose is attempting to reconnect. We have this panel of reflection speaking of desertification in Latin America and the Caribbean and basically you with a great and engaging, inspiring conversation. The first presentation along with Ramses Jose Vasquez who sent us his message from Cuba. And also we are live with Tania with the FAO and Ms. Madrigal, Executive Director of Tremendous Foundation. We're speaking about this impact and the, the role of the youth with their own initiatives in creating public policies. Could you please confirm if Rocio is back online? Yes, I give the floor back to you. I am truly sorry. My laptop just went to the blue screen. 
worst moment. No, don't worry. We're all used to this uh, glitches. It never happened to me, but in any case, I have a last question coming from the box. And this first for Tanya, what barriers? Because, well, we see this spectrum of solutions, this broad range of solutions, and it's enthusiastic, uh, it's optimistic to aim to this 1.5 degree only, but what are about the options of mitigation and adaptation from FAO in the region? Um, what do you think about the real chances of this? I think there are several actions, of course, but first I believe many of these countries in Latin America lack the financial resources for all of these plans and for the implementation of the mitigation and adaptation plans also to fulfill the commitments that are around the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, but we lack the commitment from donors or developed countries in order to implement, to deploy those financial resources that are required from these countries. In the Caribbean, we see that too, right? Small countries with not enough or well, they don't have any financial resources to fund and implement those adaptation and mitigation plans. That's first. And second, uh, I think with this COVID-19 pandemic, I think the challenge has increased in these countries. There's demands to move the economic activity, to grow, to make economies grow, and all of that, but we need to also fulfill this, the Paris Agreement commitments and the NDCs commitments. We need to bear in mind that there's a need to find after COVID a recovery that is more sustainable, more sustainable and greener. I don't think it's so easy for all of these countries and a return to a normal situation or a pre-COVID situation. So there's an opportunity, but also a huge challenge to change our lives, uh, to change things and to change, well, well, that, that's it, to change everything. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tania. Yes, I believe in that too. I think avoiding deforestation and land and habitat degradation is a way of, Solving in the long term this increase of events such as the pan this pandemic that we're living today. So thinking of interlinked uh, solutions that talk to also the regional ones is important. So just to finish this interesting panel, Land is a fundamental resource and we depend on it to survive, to find our food, uh, our water resources, but also to maintain the lives of ecosystems and continue preventing losses in biodiversity. So a better land management plays an important, significant role in desertification and climate change. So I would like to now thank you for your participation and for having answered the questions from the audience. And now, unless you have any final remark, we close this segment, this panel. Do you have any final remarks? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you, Maria Jose Martinez for that excellent moderation of the panel.
that we just heard. Now we'll take a 10 minute break and then continue with this first day of the second regional conference of the IPCC on climate change. We invite you in this 10 minute break to learn more about two projects. The first one is called Territorial that you'll see in the next video with augmented reality to value nature, allowing to know about biodiversity of our territories. We invite you to download this app that seeks to show an interesting, interesting knowledge, entertaining knowledge. And then the second project that you'll see this 10 minute reach, reach, recess is this, uh, the Blue Boat Initiative, both local and regional project with the Betty Foundation seeking to preserve whales from one of their main threats, which is maritime traffic, also monitoring the oceans and ecosystemic systems um, so fundamental in mitigating the actions of climate change. We'll meet in 10 minutes. <laughs>